Welcome to our event today, celebrating Julia Child and this new book of her brilliant quotes, People Who Love to Eat are always the best people uh, from Penguin Random House. Uh, we're joined today by chef and author Jacques Pepin, Michelin starred chef Anita Lowe, and Julia Child's great nephew and co-author Alex Prudhomme. I'm Craig Lamolt. I'm a reporter at GBH News. Uh, first, let's take a moment to remember a bit of Julia Child's incredible life and career. She was born in 1912, graduated from Smith College and worked for the OSS during World War II. She married Paul Child and they moved to Paris where she studied the Cordon Bleu and her first volume of uh, Mastering the Art of French Cooking was published in 1961. In 1963, Boston's WGBH launched the French Chef television series, which made Julia Child a national celebrity, earning her the Peabody Award in 1964 and several Emmys along the way. Her 50 year career made her a beloved culinary icon. In 2002, her Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts kitchen was displayed at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Uh, and she was awarded the French Legion of Honor, uh, the US Presidential Medal of Freedom, uh, and, and many, many other awards. Um, uh, she passed away uh, in 2004, two days before her 92nd birthday. Since then, the Julia Child Foundation for Gastronomy and the Culinary Arts has continued her legacy by educating and encouraging others to cook and to eat and to drink well, and through grants uh, and by presenting the annual Julia Child Award. And as we're getting ready for Thanksgiving next week, I, I think her spirit and her inspiration lives on in all of us. And it's great to have such an amazing panel with us today to celebrate that. Um, I wanna begin by thanking everyone who's joined us today from our leadership circle and RLS members. We really appreciate your continued genuous, gen generous support. Uh, a few housekeeping items before we start. Um, don't worry what you're wearing today. We will not be able to hear or see you, uh, we, but we do wanna hear your questions. And uh, you can ask a question by opening up the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen where you can type your question in. Uh, also, as you're asking these questions, be sure to let us know where you're tuning in from uh, and when you submit that question. Also, if you see a question that you want to hear the answer to, you can upvote it by clicking the thumbs up. Um, it, that will move the, the questions up and we'll make sure to get as many of the, the questions, especially the ones that uh, a lot of people want to uh, have the answers to. Uh, we'll make sure to get to as many of them as we can. We have, uh, we have a lot of great questions, I'm sure. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our guests. First of all, Jacques Pepin is the winner of 16 James Beard Awards and a Daytime Emmy Lifetime Achievement Award. He's also the author of 29 cookbooks. He starred in 12 acclaimed PBS cooking series and was awarded France's highest distinction, the Legion of Honor. Welcome, thanks so much for, for joining us. Thank you, thank you for having me, I'm honored. Alex Prudhomme is Julia Child's great nephew and the co-author of her autobiography, My Life in France. He's the author of The French Chef in America and has also authored or co-authored four other books. His work has appeared in the New York Times, The New Yorker, and many other publications. Alex, thanks for being here. Glad to be here. Thanks for including me. Also, Anita Lowe is an acclaimed chef who worked at Boulay and Chanterelle before opening her own Michelin-starred Anissa in Greenwich Village in 2000. Food and Wine named her one of the 10 best new chefs in America, and the Village Voice proclaimed her the best new restaurant chef. She's appeared uh, on Top Chef Masters, Iron Chef America, and Chopped, and in 2015 became the first female guest chef to cook at the White House. Anita Lowe, thank you so much for, for joining us. Thanks for having me. This is, uh, what, a, what a wonderful panel here. This is great. Um, I have a few questions before we open it up to the, the general audience here. Anita, I'd like to begin with you. Um, and also I, I wanna talk, read some of the quotes that we have in this, this book collection that's just come out of, of quotes from Julia Child. Uh, she said at one point, I think every woman should have a blowtorch. Uh, and can you tell us a little bit about what kind of inspiration Julia was to your career and you think to, to other women chefs as well, as well as what she did for French cooking in this country? Well, certainly. Um, yeah, I mean, I think represent, rep representation matters. I think um, studies have shown that, you know, when you can see someone who succeeded in a certain field that you, you can identify with on some level, um, 
you know, in, in this case, a, a woman, um, you know, then you're more likely to think that you can do the same thing. So yeah, um, yeah, and you know, I I would say that Julia Child um, was was very much responsible for making French cuisine the reigning cuisine of the time when I was coming up in the restaurant business. Um, I think, you know, it's I ended up. Um, going to France to, you know, I'm French trained. I think, that, um, you know, she's gotta be um, largely responsible for that, that I chose, you know, that I chose French cuisine, so. Yeah, right. And, and I mean, well, you know, another quote uh, I wanted to read here is, uh, she, she said, learn to cook, try new recipes, learn from your mistakes, be fearless, and above all, have fun. Uh, and Jacques, I wanted, I, I watched this week uh, an episode uh, of you and Julia making lobster souffle together on her Cooking with the Master Chefs show. And she said in that quote, uh, as she said in that quote, it, it looked like the two of you were having a lot of fun cooking together. And I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what it was like to cook with Julia and, and any favorite memories that, that you have of, of being in the kitchen with her. I met Julia in 1960, you know, so that's a long, long time ago. I was in this country about six months and I met Julia and I met James Beard and Craig LeBorn. These were the, the trinity of cooking in America. And I remember the first time that I met her, we spoke French. Her French was better than my English. I wasn't there that long. And uh, since then, we've always been being French. She always said that uh, we started cooking uh, together. Uh, well, because she started cooking in France in 1949, and I entered apprenticeship in 1949, a bit younger than her. But anyway, there was a certain style of the time, uh, a certain way of cooking too, that we, we both uh, were, uh, you know, apprentice to. And uh, yeah, certainly for me, we had a great time. We argue a lot. And uh, often people do not realize that the whole the whole show that we did together, whether it was at Boston University or the one for uh, American Bachelor or the series we did together, we never had any recipe in any of those shows. So uh, we had an idea, of course, there, we're going to do a lobster souffle, but not really any recipe to follow to. So there was a lot of uh, give and take and argument, and it, I think it made it better, and a lot of wine, too. <laughs> Actually, it's kind of amazing to hear that because you never see uh, chefs on these cooking shows that consulting the recipe very carefully. They just sort of say it off. But I, I think I always assumed that somehow off camera, they were they were checking the recipes, but you were really kind of doing it from memory or were you making it up as you go along? I mean, there, there's, a, there's a lot of, as you said, give and take. Well, I, I know some people cooking on television to, who do look at the recipe all the time. Uh, usually in a professional kitchen, I don't think I had a cookbook before I came to America. So we cooked, uh, you work in a restaurant and you, uh, you recognize, I mean, if I close my eyes, I taste the lobster souffle of the Plaza Atene, I can recognize all the striped bass of the pavilion of the chicken of my mother. You know, so we work not by recipe, but, but by taste memory. And in that sense, we were much freer in the kitchen. You know, why did I put scallion in there? Because they happened to be on the table. So was it in the recipe? Probably not doesn't really make any difference. So we cook like Fran cooks at home without uh, trying to follow a script, just uh, follow taste, taste added, taste. Julia always said, taste it. What do you think? Taste it, what do you think? So of course, when I tested that, I think it needs salt. She would test and say, no, I don't think so. Next time I would test it. I said, I think it's fine. She said, it needs salt. She would do so. So we are at those little, uh, argument too, but we had a great time. And that's the idea for her. I mean, basically she always say, you have to have fun, you know? And the joy that we saw on this, on our television screens is, it, it, it was real, right? I mean, that, that's what she was like in, in the, in the oh, kitchen. Absolutely. People always ask me, how oh, was Julia in normal life? I said, what do you mean? She was exactly the way she was on television. And yes, she, she was right. I mean, cooking is the art of, uh, of recovery or compensation or adjustment, you know, I mean, you never have exactly the same chicken, exactly the same 
type of a pan that you cook with gas electric, it's humid, it's not humid, you're in a good mood, you're in a bad mood. So things change all the time. So it's a question of adjustment, testing to, and having fun. And Anita, I wanted to, I meant to ask you, you got a chance, you cooked for Julia early in your own career, right? Yes. What was yes. that like? What, what was that experience? I mean, to I mean, she was a pretty well-known person there. I mean, you knew who you were cooking for, right? What was that experience like? Oh, it, it was really thrilling. I mean, I was the chef of Maxime's back in the day. Um, we were basically a lunch restaurant or, you know, if, if you could even call it a restaurant. I mean, it was like we weren't very busy. But um, she knew um, the general manager, I guess. And so he had invited her in um, for lunch and I had prepared this, you know, I, I mean, I was like 20, 20 something at the time. Um, I had prepared this, you know, long tasting menu, you know, I, I had brought in all these fancy ingredients and blah, blah, blah. And um, she sat down and looked over the menu and she said, oh, I'll have the roast chicken. So, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I think she enjoyed it. Um, it was a thrill to meet her. Um, it's funny that you say that because one of the quotes in here, I'm, I'm, I'm flipping through looking for it, but is, is about choosing the roast chicken at a restaurant and that you could actually really tell uh, a, a fine restaurant, but how they, how well they do a roast chicken, that it's not the most complicated thing in a well, in the world, but that they do it. Uh, of course, she said it in, in a much more um, uh, articulate way than I'm saying it, but that, but you can learn a lot about a restaurant and a chef from how they make chicken. Well, we'll see. We, we don't know what she thought, but <laughs> hopefully she liked it. <laughs> she seemed to like it when I, when I went to talk to her. So I'm sure she did. I'm sure she did. Alex, I wanted to ask you that one other quote here uh, from, from, from the book that I'm reading is dining with one's friends and beloved family is certainly one of life's primal and most innocent delights. One that is both soul satisfying and eternal. She really had a way with words, didn't she? Um, but in addition to being her co-author, you were also part of that beloved family that she's, she's talking about. Did you celebrate Thanksgiving with her? And what, what was Thanksgiving with Julia Child like? Hmm. You got a couple hours? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was very lucky, well, along with my sisters and cousins. Um, we are all related to Julia through our granduncle, Paul Child, who was the twin brother of my grandfather, Charlie Child. And so Paul and Julia never had kids of their own, uh, but they treated us as surrogate grandchildren in a way. Uh, and we grew up with them both watching Julia on television and uh, the on television was the real Julia. I mean, she wasn't really much different in, in person, uh, uh, you know, always uh, cracking wise, losing her glasses on the top of her head, throwing a baguette off, you know, um, but also very serious about her cooking and her food and, and including all of us in whatever she was making. And, you know, Thanksgiving was a, was a family uh, adventure because uh, we would often uh, uh, cook with Julia in Cambridge or at my parents in Connecticut or at my grandparents in Pennsylvania and she would put everybody to work. Uh, she'd say, now you get the butter diced and you wash the lettuce and, and you help uh, Paul pick out the wine. And um, so it was, it was, it was great. And, and one of the things that made an adventure is you never knew what she was gonna serve. Um, I think as Jacques said, she would serve whatever she found in the fridge almost. Um, and so one year it would be a, a, a stuffing uh, full of oysters, which was incredibly rich. Um, uh, another year uh, she did um, uh, uh, a whipped uh, chestnuts, uh, which was fantastic. Um, I think the showstopper for me as a kid was the pumpkin soup that she served in a hollowed out pumpkin, um, which was basically heavy cream with a little bit of pumpkin in it. Wow, uh, that sounds uh, amazing. And the fun thing about being in Cambridge with her is that uh, she kept her phone number in the phone book. And so on Thanksgiving day, the phone would be ringing and she'd pick it up in the middle of cooking with all of us around. And it would be somebody who was stressed out about their turkey that was either burnt uh, to a charcoal or a frozen solid still. And the guests were about to come over, you know, they'd say, you know, Julia, what should I do? And, and she said, oh, dearie, just calm down now. Let's see. And she sort of walked them through it. She'd 
to get them to um, step by step uh, save the bird. And uh, and she made a big point of uh, as a, of, of kind of demystifying cooking and making it fun and approachable. And, and one of the ways that she did that on Thanksgiving was to say, um, you know, a turkey doesn't have to be perfect to be delicious. Uh, so if it's a little burnt on one side, who cares? Um, if it's a little frozen, okay, you cut that piece off and put that back in the oven. Uh, the point is to be with friends and family and to enjoy food together. Um, and that quote that you just mentioned uh, really gets down to that because when we were working on her memoir together, she said to me, you know, the, the, her favorite thing in the world was to cook with other people, particularly good friends and family. And, you know, to that point, what you just said, I feel like the quotes that are that are in this book and the things that we all sort of um, remember her saying, um, in a way, a lot of them are about cooking, but truly the the wisdom that she shares is not just limited to the kitchen is it it's 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 these these comments these um lessons that we can really take with us everywhere absolutely i mean the book opens with one of my favorite julia quotes uh which you mentioned earlier but she says uh learn to cook try new recipes learn from your mistakes be fearless and above all have fun and, and she would often add never apologize for mistakes you made in the kitchen. Um, and uh, she applied that philosophy to food and to cooking, uh, but really it's a, it's a life lesson. It's something that you can apply to anything. And it's, it's in typical Julia fashion, it's sort of deceptively simple. It seems like a simple throwaway, but when you really stop to think about it, it's very empowering. Um, and one of the things that Julia did in the 60s and 70s and into the 80s was to empower people, um, largely women, but not only women, also men and children all across the country of every race and creed you can imagine, um, and gave them permission to make mistakes and to try new things and to be adventurous um, and uh, to express themselves through food. Um, and it was a very powerful thing. And I think in a sense, for me, that's really her lasting legacy. Yeah, yeah. We have a, a, already a, a ton of, of great questions, I think, from the uh, from the audience, and I want to make sure that we get to as many of them as possible. So I'm just going to jump in right now with those. Um, but I want to remind everybody that if you do have questions that you'd like to have answered, just open up the Q&A tab in the bottom and uh, type in your question. And don't forget to tell us you know, where your, your name and where you're writing from. Um, and also upvote the questions that you would like the answers to, because we're, we're going to make sure to try to get to as many of those as possible. The first one I want to ask is, is from Chris from Brooklyn. Line. Um, and uh, it's a great question. He says, what three things, whether they be tools of the trade or foodstuffs, did Julia feel were essential, aside from butter? Uh, we, I think we can assume that butter was one of them. But um, aside from butter, what three things were essential? And along those lines, um, what, what do our guests consider to be their top three? Um, uh, I guess, Jacques, can we be maybe with you? What, what did you do you know what, what things she, she considered to be most essential? And, and, and to you, what What's most important in the kitchen? Well, uh, <laughs> I guess to start with, she loved a good rubber spatula, a good pot, you know, a good pot. I mean, something solid and all that. And, uh, you know, certainly a glass of wine next to, <laughs> next to the food uh, to enjoy it. But you do usually, uh, we agree what we cook together because we agree to essential thing that if the, the quality of the ingredient, you know, the simplicity of the recipe, uh, the sharing with friends, I mean, those are very, very important uh, things which uh, we partake, I think, that we agree with, you know, so, yeah. Are there, are there sp specific ingredients that, that uh, you... Uh, well, to... right, yeah, you know, from cream to butter to eggs to, I mean, she was never afraid of, uh, of anything uh, uh, which has to do with, uh, with calorie or anything like this. No, yeah, the best, the best is always the best, yes. I mean, I remember uh, calling the butcher uh, in uh, in Cambridge there when we were cooking, you know, talking about the quality of the meat and whether the, the beef was aged enough and whether uh, you had taken it out of the cryovac so it can age a little more and so forth. Yes, she she uh, she was very concerned about the quality of the ingredient and uh, yeah. Anita, what's most essential to you? Are there three things that, that come to mind that, that you just, you can't live without when you're cooking? 
Might well, have. David Boulay always said that your hands were the most important tool in the kitchen, and I agree. I think um, your hands, your senses, and your brain. Can't cook without those three things. <clears throat> Certainly not. Certainly not. Alex, do you have uh, anything to add in terms of what, what Julia, uh, you know, found was most essential and, and also for yourself when you're cooking? Uh, sure. She always called herself a, a copper freak, a knife freak, uh, and a frying pan freak. Uh, she was a kitchen gadget freak, basically, and she loved to collect things and try new tools. Uh, when the cuisine art first came out, she was one of the first people to get one. Um, she was uh, experimenting with the microwave and she used it to, uh, to uh, dry out a newspaper that had gotten wet in the rain and she set the thing on fire. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> that's Julia for you, uh, always pushing the envelope. Um, she also, we used to play a game, which was if, you're, if you were on death row and you had a last meal, what would it be? Um, and she would usually start with some variation of the very first meal she had in France, which was to start with some delicious fresh oysters or maybe some caviar um, with a little champagne, uh, move on to a uh, sole meunier, which is a, a, a flounder-like fish cut, cooked in a sputtering butter sauce, uh, a little sprinkle of parsley on top, or, or maybe a roast duck. She loved duck. Um, a salad verde, a green salad uh, with a wedge of uh, delicious brie cheese, uh, some kind of chocolate or apple dessert uh, and a cafe filtre, uh, and of course, uh, plenty of delicious wine. Um, and it's hard to argue with that. I kind of go with her. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and and, and to, to echo what Jacques was saying, you know, whether it was the freshest vegetable or the choicest cut of meat, she was all about flavor. Um, and one of the great moments you'll see online, uh, Jacques and Julia have a little disagreement about um, uh, flavor versus health, uh, you know, nutrition. Uh, I think you were making some kind of a spinach dish or something. <laughs> and Jacques was trying to make the point that, well, this is spinach is very healthy for you and it should be delicious. And, and Julia said, we don't care about whether it's nutritious. We just want to move it. Does it, is it taste good, you know? Um, and that was, that was her mantra. It had to taste good. And as Anita said, you need your hands and your brain to make that happen. And um, um, again, she, she made cooking fun and, and approachable. Um, and, and we all uh, went along for the ride with her. You know, I'm just, I'm just looking at the book because you said a couple of things there that reminds me of quotes in there. One was uh, a pretty strong statement against anything that could be considered health food. She, she wasn't no fan of health food, certainly. Uh, and the other was, I was, I was struck by what you were saying about her use of like the Cuisinart, for example. And I think there's um, a tendency maybe in some to, uh, to want to do things in a traditional way that like by doing it uh, in a, uh, an older way, maybe that, you know, required more muscle and hands and time um, that, that, that that's more valuable, but she didn't, she didn't feel that way, right? I mean, the Cuisinart came out and she said, oh, more, it's, it's easier to do this and now maybe it's more accessible for more people to do this kind of cooking. Absolutely. Um, and the quintessential story about that was um, there's a, a dish called uh, canel, which are uh, basically little uh, fish dumplings almost. And it's made uh, traditionally by mashing um, uh, shrimp and uh, their shells through a sieve. And it's very work intensive. It's, you have to be really strong to do it. And when the cuisine art came along, she'd just zap them up and it would be done. And, 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 and she would use the cuisine art for uh, uh, everything, really. I mean, uh, baking, she would use it to prepare the dough. And um, she said, why waste the time if you've got this tool that will help you? Um, although she wasn't afraid of hard work. I mean, one, one thing that people are always surprised to hear is that she would say, uh, the, the, the cook that is afraid of doing dishes is working against themselves. In other words, if it takes an extra bowl to do something right, use it. Uh, don't worry about the dishes and then get everybody to help do the dishes at the end. And that's kind of fun. Anita, we have a question here from um, uh, Adam uh, who asks about French cooking. And, and you talked about going to France and studying and learning in France. Um, he asks about, is, is there an inherent risk or um, bias that French is the best when we, when we, uh, in terms of cooking. And also he asked about 
uh, you know, if, if Julia championed other uh, styles of cooking as well. How do you feel about uh, sort of the, um, the sort of the, the pedestal? And of course, I want to ask Jacques about this as well, but the pedestal that, that French cooking has um, in, in, uh, in cuisine. Well, I think it's been toppled in, in, in recent years. Um, you know, I mean, as someone who trained in France and uses that technique as my base for pretty much everything, um, you know, there's, there's, there's some merit to that. That being said, you, you know, there's so many cuisines in the world and there's so many great cuisines in the world that it's ridiculous to think that one cuisine is better than another. I, you know, I, I prescribe to you know, cultural relati relativity. So, um, yeah, I think everything needs to be <clears throat> um, looked at it within its own context, so. Alex, did, did uh, Julia celebrate other uh, cuisines uh, in addition to French cooking? She did. I mean, I think the point that Anita makes is good that, that she was rooted in French technique, um, she, which she considered the best. You know, it had been codified way back and she liked the fact that there were rules to French cooking and that once you um, mastered that or got close to that, um, you could apply that to any cuisine. I mean, her second favorite cuisine in the world was Chinese. Uh, and she felt that there was a great kinship between Chinese and French cookery, which I think uh, people are coming around to now. But when she first started saying this, people didn't understand what she was talking about. Uh, these are both ancient cuisines. Um, uh, and uh, uh, she would, uh, you know, sometimes be provocative, like you mentioned, the, the health food thing. Um, she would say, you know, health food is like bird food. Uh, but I think she got, she would say things like that, or she would say, I hate Italian food, which was totally untrue because I ate many Italian meals with her. But she would say these things to get people <laughs> talking and thinking about food. And that was really her goal. Um, you know, she kind of liked being a celebrity, but what she was really about was being a teacher uh, and a student. She called herself an eternal pupil and she always wanted to learn something more. Um, and so later in life, she did the, a couple of television series uh, where she went across the country cooking with master chefs of different cuisines. Um, and she was endlessly curious and that was one of her defining traits. And so, um, Although she was rooted in French cuisine, uh, she was very open-minded. And in fact, in 1975, wrote a book called From Julia Child's Kitchen, which was the first departure for her from French cuisine. And she included recipes from around the world. So it was something that, that she took to in, in mid-career. Jacques, what do you think of that idea of the, the French technique being sort of a, a basis, a groundwork uh, on which uh, other, other cuisines can sort of be built upon as, as you learn to, uh, to be a chef? Well, somewhat. I mean, for me, I've been I've been a chef for seventy one years now, you know, and uh, so of course those grounding, uh, those, those basic technique and all that were very important. In fact, when we did our show with Julia, she said, "Write down what you want to do." So I write down about eighty ideas, and she did about the same thing. And I think three of my ideas made the show. <laughs> <laughs> so she wanted to do, and then we received many, many letters which say that she was much more French than I was. That being said, you know, in the thing, we end up doing hamburger and we end up doing all kind of things that we like to eat. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the cuisine which stay with you, the most important cuisine for anyone in the world is those uh, visceral tastes that you have when you have a child whether you come from Vietnam or South Africa or anywhere you go, the thing that other people may look at say that's pretty disgusting. For you, it's the greatest thing in the world. Uh, for me as well. I mean, I remember, I mean, at home, I have 12 restaurants I can think of in my family in France, 12 of them owned by women. So uh, I was the first male to go into that business. So those uh, formidable woman, you know, my two aunt, cousin, mother, and so forth, at their way of cooking, uh, which was usually very straightforward and simple. Even though when I was the chef to the, the president in France, I remember going back to, uh, to Lyon, to uh, my mother and to my aunt, getting into the kitchen, she threw me out. She said, you too much better get out of here too. No one was very impressed with, uh, with that type of thing. So that type of cooking, uh, certainly wherever you come in the world, and in America more than any 
place. There is 24,000 restaurants in New York. So the, the amount of ethnicity that we have in this country is unmatched anywhere in the world. And yes, she was open to that uh, without any question. I, 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 many times I went to Chinese restaurants with her in downtown in Boston. So yeah, she loved it. Nice. Uh, Jacques, we have a, a question from Don who asks, how did WGBH get to be the place uh, for all these fabulous chefs and, and gardeners and uh, others? Uh, did that start with Julia? Um, do, do you have any, any sense of, of uh, the role that she played in kind of putting uh, GBH on the map? For me, no. I, I, I mean, she started with 1963, I believe. And uh, I don't think there was any cooking show at the time. And I still remember her uh, talking to me. I mean, Paul was sitting on the floor or whatever and people showing a recipe. I mean, this was a very limited staff. I mean, of cooking together. I don't really think that uh, she ever thought that she would have the impact that she had eventually. And uh, yes, GBH was probably the first one, then the WNET, a few others. But uh, uh, yeah, that's where it started. I can add a little to that. Um, she uh, began uh, just on a whim, really, uh, at GBH in 63. And um, there were actually some other cooking shows. There were, there were a number of small little cooking shows across the country at that point. But mostly they were uh, sort of a housewife show or a restaurateur in a, in a small city. And none of them really broke through. Julia was the first one to really break through and become our first true celebrity television chef. And it was because of this infectious enthusiasm she has combined with her deep knowledge um, and uh, GBH um, was a major public television station and other places began to carry Julia's show. But the other important thing, and maybe Anita could speak to this, but Julia was very good at mentoring other chefs, um, um, whether they're the home cook or professional chefs in a, in a restaurant, um, especially women, which was quite unusual in, in the early 60s at that point. And, um, so there was a collection of very good uh, cooks all around uh, Cambridge and Boston. Uh, there was a kind of a, um, a, 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 a farmers, uh, a farm to table scene happening there without that name. Um, and uh, so having someone like Julia as, as a guiding light, as a North star for these chefs was really powerful. And she was very encouraging of everybody else. And Anita, you, you mentioned you, you you watched that show as well, right? I mean, what what did it what was it to you to to see her uh, on the TV cooking and and uh, and what she was doing? Did that did that help to in, inspire you? Oh, certainly, yeah. I mean, I watched all of those shows when I was a kid. I loved Julia. I loved the Galloping Gourmet. Um, yeah, I mean, I think food was one of the better parts of my childhood, and so you know, we sort of gravitate to that as a, as an adult. Um, yeah. we, we have a great question from Jonathan who wants to know, what do you think is the one recipe that Julia would hope everyone would try to master from her cookbook? Uh, what do you each think of that? What, 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 if we were to open up her, one of her cookbooks, what one recipe would she really want us to give a shot to? But I, I would say there are two. Chicken. Go ahead, John. <laughs> yeah, right. A roast chicken, and you know, she was very strong in making bread too. Uh, you know, making a baguette was a big deal, especially at that time. You, know, you couldn't really get a good baguette in, in store. So she spent a great deal of time, you know, working on this. But otherwise, yes, simple roast chicken, a great salad, you know, and a great salad is not that easy to do. So she was good on those very Simple thing, and I know when I started cooking with her, you know, she would tell me, you know, you're too serious. Uh, this is television, you know, this is entertainment. You have to light up. It's true. At, however, at the end of the show, we always say, she always say, okay, what did we teach today? What did we do? There was always that, uh, you know, that teaching uh, part of the show, which was very important for her. Yeah, and for me too. Yeah, I would add uh, roast chicken for sure, and probably a boeuf bourguignon, uh, which sounds fancy, but it's really a beef stew. And right. she liked it because it, it, it was kind of a, 
a peasant dish, I guess, Jacques, if you would agree. I mean, it's a simple dish uh, that could be done in a fancy way or a simple way. Um, and it, it was something that helped her demystify French cooking for people. And of course, she loved desserts. And so she would love to do the uh, Ren de Saba, the queen of, of Sheba chocolate, flourless chocolate cake, which is really good. Or a tart tatin, which is a upside down uh, uh, glazed apple dessert, which is fabulous uh, and really good at this time of year. So uh, we're about to make a buff bourguignon this weekend. And so I recommend everybody uh, try it. It's really appropriate for this season. You know, yeah, I was we, actually watching. Added, old, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You know, we had it in the show, the beef bourguignon, you know, because she chose that. You know, we're going to do that. Another thing she loved in dessert was the crepe. You know, we did crepe yeah. several times. We did a gato of crepe. We did it one way or the other too. So she yeah. loved the simplicity of it, fast and the, the good result. You know of it. Yes. I was just going to say I was watching uh, old episodes of her um, before this, and and I I think I saw I was watching on the PBS app. Actually, you can watch really really old episodes, and I think the very first TV episode she did was Beef Bourguignon. Actually, uh, I, I think that's yeah. what I was watching, and and so she if you're you're absolutely right. Actually, from the very beginning, like this is this is what she wanted to to share with the world. I think Anita, is there is there a a recipe of hers that that you think is is particularly important for for people? to get to, to try themselves? Uh, I mean, I think her brownies are from one of her later books, uh, Cooking with Julia, uh, Baking with Julia, are, are the best brownies there are. So, <laughs> um, and that's my go-to brownie recipe, so. Okay, I'm gonna have to want. You know, it, it's tough to do this right at noon because it's not like I had lunch prior to us starting, and <laughs> now I'm just like thinking about all of these things that I really want to eat. Uh, we have a, a ton of great questions from the audience. We're gonna get to a lot more of them, but before we move on, I want to I want to take a moment to introduce my colleague Jamie, uh, who's gonna come in for a second. Jamie, hi. Hi there. How are you? Great. I'm really enjoying today's event too, and I'm feeling um, more hungry than ever listening to all this talk about baguettes and brownies and delicious food. But um, hello everyone, hello to our viewers at home, and thanks so much for spending some time with us today. You know, there's something so meaningful about a community of people brought together by a book. And today's book is inspired by one of America's most iconic television chefs, Julia Child. You know, the great thing about books and GBH is both are commercial free. GBH is member supported, and that means we're here because you want us here. Our commercial free status also means we count on your support. Today, if you are able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustaining member, you will receive a copy of Julia Child's People Who Love to Eat Are Always the Best People as a special thank you gift from GBH. You know, as we navigate this ever-changing reality, financial support from our donors helps keep us going strong. Please give $5 a month or $60 all at once, whatever works for you. It's so easy. Just go to wgbh.org slash support events and contribute what you can. You can also text the word Julia, that's J-U-L-I-A, to 800-492-492. One, 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 one. And just so you know, we've included all of that information in today's chat. So you can prefer which method you think is, is easiest for you. And again, this is a win-win situation because you're gonna receive a wonderful book and you're also supporting your local public media station, GBH, at the same time. So now, Craig, I leave it back to you and our special guests with more of today's presentation. Thanks so much, Jamie, and thank you to everybody out there who supports WGBH, excuse me, GBH rather. Uh, we, uh, you know, we can't uh, continue the program that we do without your help, and also we can't bring you events like this. So thank you so much. We have again a ton of great questions, um, and uh, Jacques, I, I, the the number one question that people want to know the answer to right now is what is your favorite memory of cooking with Julia? Is there one particular moment of cooking with her that comes to mind that uh, that you can share with us? There is many, many of those, but it's usually, tough. you know, she loved to be with PBS. She loved the fact that we didn't have to cow to, to the sponsor and that type of thing. So I remember one time, I was doing, sometime we decided 10 minutes before we started what we were going to do, more or less. So I said I was going to do an apple tart 
I said, I'll start by doing the dough. I said, you want to do it? She said, no, you do the dough. So, uh, and then five minutes before we start, she said, I want to do another dough too. I said, okay. I didn't even know. So we started the show. I did a pot brisé. I rolled it. She sliced apple with me. We put it into the oven. And I said, now, Julia, I will show you another dough. And she said, well, Jacques is going to do it. I said, oh, okay, fine. She said, I want you to do it in the food processor. <laughs> I said, that's great. Yeah, fine. Uh, so, uh, uh, and that day we had the president of Lando Lake there because Lando Lake was one of the sponsors. We used tons of butter. So uh, uh, I said, okay, how much flour you want? She said, two cups. Okay, a dash of uh, salt, tablespoon of sugar. I said, how much butter? She said, I want Crisco. I said, what, what do you want? You want Crisco? We have Crisco. She had a can of Crisco underneath. So we did half butter, half Crisco. So she was like that sometime. Crazy with, I said, you know, you don't have to antagonize the sponsor. <laughs> but she was this one. She did the same thing with the, with the, with a second sponsor that we have, which was uh, Kendall Jackson. And we have Jeff Jackson and his wife, Barbara uh, Banker, which came from California to take us out for dinner. So we drank, we, we drank a lot of wine during the show and so forth. But I, I did, I don't know what we did at the end, some type of roast. I said, do you want a little bit caviar there with that? Do you want a, and she said, I want beer. So she had beer underneath. So we had beer with that. So she was very, uh, you know, very particular this way. I mean, she was who she was, and that was it. So those were funny moments. Yeah. And and didn't hesitate to surprise you when she could, it sounds like. No, no. I mean, all the show were full of surprise. We didn't really know where we were going. And that was crazy also for the cameraman, I have to say, because they didn't know whether we go this way or we go that way. And I said, we didn't have any written recipe. So uh, we could do whatever we wanted, which is, for me, better, much freer, you know. And I think it shows, you know, there is a certain freedom and uh, and friendship cooking together this way, which which show. And we are, we have great television, I have to say. Um, excuse me. <laughs> well, while he's answering the phone, I'm going to uh, ask Jacques a, a follow up because um, this is this is from uh, from Deborah, who wanted to know what uh, was what things didn't you agree with Julia on when you were on together? Uh, were, what were the most unique things that the two of you disagreed upon when you were when you were cooking together? Well, it was probably more for show than anything else. Like, you know, I use black pepper and she said, no, she wanted to use white pepper. I use kosher salt and no, no, the other salt. I mean, those were trivial things really just to make the show maybe more interesting because we did agree on, as I say, the most important thing that is the simplicity of a recipe, quality of the ingredient, particularly, and uh, the sharing and uh, all of that type of thing. So, you know, we didn't really, we agree much more than we disagree, but uh, uh, you refer to the, the, the time when I cooked spinach with her, you know, because in a sense, it was interesting because she cooked more in a style, in a French style sometimes than I did. And certainly when I worked in Paris and after for many years, we used to have spinach. We first blanch them in boiling water and take them out, refresh them, press them into a bowl. And then you have that bowl of cooked spinach. If you want to saute it or do something else, you start with this. Well, we don't do that anymore. I don't. So, you know, we had spinach. I took the spinach, put it directly into the skillet, put a tablespoon of water. It's there. And I said, she said, no, no, you got to blanch it. I said, no, it just sounds good. That's what I said. And it's more nutritious, this way. Oh, boy. Why did I say that? You know? <laughs> we don't care about nutrition and so forth. So we had those, uh, those things, or whipping a souffle together, you know. Uh, she said, I put a color. I said, I don't put a color on my souffle. I said, well, yours doesn't, doesn't, yours doesn't rise like mine or something like that, you know. So... No, we, we had a good time, but we are. You always said that you made a more American hamburger than she did, right? Well, yeah, that's true, too. You know, <laughs> we did hamburger. She wanted hamburger. So I said, I'll show you how we did it at Howard Johnson. You know, I worked for Howard Johnson 10 years. I said, we don't even put salt on it. Put the burger this way. Don't press on it. No juice, too. And I had uh, iceberg lettuce, slice of tomato. To the... No, she did the hamburger in the French style that is in a skillet. With a piece of meat, she pressed, oh no, she sauteed some onion mixed with the meat and pressed it. I said, this, this is, you know, so this is the way she did her hamburger. But then we all share our hamburger together and we had a good time. We already had a good time. 
yeah. that, that sounds pretty good. Her, her style of hamburger. I, I think yeah. uh, I could go for that right now. A- Alex, um, we have a question from Michelle in Cambridge uh, here in Massachusetts um, asking, um, do you have a fa- favorite memory of her when she was here? I mean, she lived in Cambridge for, for many years, either cooking or not cooking. Um, you know, she was she was part of this community. Uh, any, any memories of, of her here? Uh, as Jacques said, many. Um, I think some of my favorite memories are dinners at Julius and Paul's house in Cambridge. Uh, big old house um, on Irving Street, right behind Harvard Yard. Uh, you would enter the house essentially through the kitchen. The, the door would go right into the kitchen there. Um, and that was really the hub of the house. Um, and uh, if you went to a dinner party there, you never knew who was going to show up or what Julia would serve. Um, and it would you would literally sit next to a world famous chef on one side and a woman she had met at the gas station that afternoon and invited over. And uh, it was hilarious. And sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't work. Um, and, and the same with her food. Uh, she was always tinkering uh, with new recipes when you were uh, staying in her house. And the house would be full of those great aromas or sometimes not so great aromas. Uh, you know, if she was working on radicchio, you would have a radicchio uh, appetizer, an entree, and maybe even a dessert. Uh, you know, same with pumpkin. Uh, so whatever she was working on is what you would eat. Um, and uh, I remember being at some dinner parties where the meal didn't quite hold together because she kind of served whatever she was working on plus whatever was in the fridge. And people would sort of look at each other and feel a little uptight. And she just laughed. She didn't care. Uh, what she was about was getting people together over food. Um, much more often, it was delicious. And, you know, there were times when she'd really thought it through, of course. And, and Paul was a wonderful wine expert, um, kind of before that was trendy. And um, so there was always a delicious wine or two with the meal. Uh, and some of those nights went very late. Uh, she loved to uh, discuss politics or gossip or Hollywood. She loved movies. Um, and was just very interested in what everybody's story was. She wanted to know where people came from, how they ended up the way they did, what their plans were for the future. Um, and it was a great kind of salon uh, around the dinner table um, and a little bit of trial by fire. Like if you couldn't keep up with the conversation, she wouldn't make things easy. She'd just carry on. So uh, I learned to, to converse um, and to eat and, uh, and to uh, kind of, love life uh, around uh, that dinner table. You mentioned that Paul was really the, more the, the sommelier, I think, of the family, perhaps. Um, we have a question, uh, what Julia's drink or wine of choice is. Uh, do you know like what, what, a, what, an, what a favorite was? Well, uh, Paul used to make cocktails up out of whatever was in the cabinet. So uh, if you look back at some of the books, you'll see there's she's, Julia's included some of Paul's uh, homemade recipes. Um, their favorite uh, thing to serve at a cocktail party were um, the Pepperidge Farm uh, goldfish crackers and what they called a reverse martini, uh, which was the uh, mostly vermouth with a little uh, floater of gin on top, uh, which was something that FDR liked to drink also. Um, and uh, in terms of wines, um, you know, she grew up in California. Um, but out there, they, in, when she was growing up, uh, they really only had very basic red wine, which they called two buck chuck. Uh, and uh, that was wine to her and it was only drunk at dinner. And one of the great revelations uh, of living in France was that um, wine was really part of the meal. Um, not breakfast, but certainly lunch uh, and dinner. And wine was treated as as uh, as a food, and and was complementary to the to the meal that one was having. And her very first meal in France, November third, nineteen forty eight, when she had a saumonière, uh, Paul ordered a, bo- a bottle of uh, of white wine that um, blew her mind. And and it was that meal that really set her on on the course of her career, um, and uh, piqued her interest in wine. And in the very first cookbook. Mastering the Art of French Cooking, um, with Paul's help, she includes a wine tutorial about um, wh- you know, how to cork wine, uh, how to pair wine, uh, why wine, different uh, you know, uh, grapes uh, produce different wines. It's, it's fabulous, and I'm, it's still valuable today. 
Great. We have a nice comment from uh, Xavier who says, as the cook in my family, sometimes it can become a chore. Uh, I've been watching Chef Pepin's Facebook videos and it's helped uh, to think simple. What other recommendations do you have for keeping things exciting in the kitchen, especially as we're starting to eat out less? Uh, Anita, can I start with you there? What, what, are, what are things that you would recommend that people can do to, uh, to keep things interesting and, and fun in the kitchen? I think explore new cuisines, you know? I mean, you can go online right now. You don't even need a cookbook um, and learn about the world. I, I love travel. I think that's one of the, one of the, one of my biggest um, influences on my, on my cooking, in my cooking. And um, yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's, it's always exciting to learn about different cultures and, and to read about, uh, about, the stories about where these these recipes come from and then and then try them. Yeah, definitely. I think it's it's all too easy to sort of fall into a, to a habit, right? This is this is how we you know make this recipe. This is what we usually eat. You know, to to kind of broaden out and to to try something new and be a little bit more adventurous, which I think is is part of what what Julia was all about, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, Jacques, Jacques, do you have anything to add just in terms of, uh, you know, Xavier said that his, you, that your videos have been an inspiration yeah, yeah. to him. Certainly, I agree entirely with, you know, with Alex, uh, the joy of cooking that she had. And, you know, I remember going in their house with my wife too, always through the back into the kitchen. The only time I went through the front, it was because Paul took me there to show me, he did a stand window in the door in front. He was a, he was a good artist, wanted to show it to me too. Likewise, you know, we ate in the kitchen on the table clothes, she cleaned up the thing and that was the kitchen usually. So, you know, those type of idea, even now, you know, this is what you have to think about the joy of cooking, being together and so forth. People say, I don't know how to cook. What do you think I should do? I said, well, do you have a friend who knows how to cook? Next time you go to that, that friend, you know, say, can I come an hour ahead? I bring a bottle of wine and cook with you. So you do that and you drink the bottle of wine. And if the chicken is a bit burned, who cares? <laughs> so yes, joy of cooking is very important. Yeah. And, and sharing that cooking with sharing. each other. That's wonderful. Jacques, the, the number one thing people are asking right now or would like the answer to uh, that I have to ask is uh, people would like to know your mother's chicken recipe. My mother's chicken recipe? Yeah, it says, can you share his, his mother? I think you mentioned it earlier that uh, your mother's chicken recipe, and I think everybody would love to know. Well, that's a very that simple, you know, I'm from Bourg-en-Bresse, Bresse, B-R-E-S-S-E, the best chicken in France. So in apprenticeship, it was always chicken. My mother, it's a, it's a chicken uh, in cream sauce, which we did different variations, but the variation, she just cut the chicken, saute it, a blanc, we call a blanc, that is without browning it, just very lightly. And uh, she put a teaspoon of flour on top of it, deglaze with a bit of white wine, some water, an onion, thyme bay leaf, cook it 30 minutes, take it out and add heavy cream, the thick heavy cream that we are. Sometimes she even mix an egg yolk with some heavy cream to finish the sauce. But basically that uh, very straightforward, simple chicken in cream sauce, as I say, it's kind of a visceral taste for me. And if I close my eyes, I tested, I said, that's my mother, chicken and cream sauce. Yes. You're that making me hungry, Jacques. <laughs> that does sound amazing. Um, a question uh, for, uh, I think, all of you is, is someone uh, would like to know what culinary school you consider the best for training today? Well, there is many. I mean, you know, from, from the CIA to Johnson & Well, to uh, th those are grade school which did not exist, you know, when I came to America. Uh, I, uh, I remember here in 1959, uh, I worked at the Pavilion, then moved on to Howard Johnson. The first time I met an American chef was because Mr. Johnson said, if Jacques want to work for us, he has to work in one of our restaurants. So I ended up on Howard Johnson on, the, on Queen Boulevard, and it was all black kids working in the kitchen there. That was the first kind of American chef that I knew. All the chefs I knew in New York, 59, 60, the great restaurant too, where uh, Italian, uh, Swiss, a lot of Swiss, Italian, German, French, and all that. So it was a, a new world that the CIA did when they stopped opening and training chefs. And now we have extraordinary chefs in this country. You know, so. And Boston University, where you have taught 
and oh, yeah. uh, is right there in town. So yeah, thirty-five years. Yeah. Anita, what do you think about that? Um, you know, I've hired a lot of students from ICE, which is the International uh, Center. I don't remember what it's culinary. called. Culinary. <laughs> culinary education. <laughs> oh, you said, yeah, whatever it is. In any case, um, yeah, they, they, all, they all seem very well trained. I mean, yeah, there, there are a lot, a lot of cooking schools out there around the country. So, and, uh, and around the world. Um, it depends on what you want to learn. I mean, there's also the natural gourmet if you're interested in more um, plant forward dining and very interested in health and et cetera. So. You know, we have a question from Carol Ann in Canton who'd like to know if Julia preferred a certain type of uh, cookware and uh, asking if, if any of you uh, have uh, have preferences for what kind of cookware you like. <laughs> That's the world yeah. behind me. <laughs> yeah. We have the world behind me, although I'd say I don't use much copper anymore. I have problem with my shoulder, it's too heavy and so forth. So I always go back to a few. It used to be that it was difficult to find good cookware, not any longer. I mean, you know, you have thick, heavy uh, aluminum now lined up with stainless steel or from copper to non-stick to, no, I mean, uh, there is a plenty of, uh, of cookware that you can get on the market, uh, which will do the job for you, yes. Yeah. And need any, any favors, any recommendations? I have That's mostly true, yeah. all clad, but you know, it was all sort of given to me or, or I think I won a whole set playing golf once, um, but I love it. I, I think it's, I think, I think they're great. They've never warped and um, even cooking served me well, but I also love, um, I, I also love my Le Creuset um, for, for braising. And I have a whole bunch of um, cast iron for my wood burning oven. Alex, anything? <laughs> uh, I'm actually the, exactly the same as Anita. Uh, those three, the, the Creuset, the, the, um, the cast iron, um, and the, uh, the all clad. Um, but uh, really, anything that's quality, I think it's important to have quality cookware. Uh, it's worth making the investment because those things will often outlive us. So uh, why not spend the money and, and get you know the best that you can at, at that moment? Yeah. Um, more questions here. Uh, you know, a bunch of people want to ask about um, eating eggs. How many eggs we should be eating a week, and uh, is is so much butter safe? I mean, you know, uh, Julia didn't care about health, but uh, I guess a lot of people out there, you know, do, and and they're and they're worried. Are are we are we eating well enough, and and uh, is it uh, is it okay to eat so much eggs and butter? Eggs is certainly a fit for me one of the greatest protein, providing that you get eggs of quality, uh, which has been uh, laid by a chicken with happy, meaning it's running around and eating uh, grass and, uh, you know, insect and so forth. So without any question, I mean, I remember 10, 15 years ago giving classes. I mean, we were limited by two eggs a week or one, two eggs a week. I mean, according to the medical establishment, it was totally ridiculous. You know, because uh, uh, there is nothing as good as eggs in terms of protein and all that. Low in calorie, and eggs is like 100 calories, almost nothing at all. So, yes, eggs and chicken for me, uh, I don't know which came first, but uh, <laughs> yeah, very important. <laughs> Yeah, Anita, do you worry about this at all? The, you know, the, the, the ingredients that you use and, and uh, the, the health of them, are, is this important to you as you're you know, planning a menu? You know, I never did before. And I, you know, I was trained in France and it was all whatever. It doesn't taste good. That's the most important thing. Um, yeah, I, I was on Julia's team, but I, I was recently diagnosed with really bad GERD, which is acid reflux. And so now I, I have to limit those things. Um, but yeah, it depends, you know? I, I mean, do you have high cholesterol? You know, um, then you should probably worry about it. If you don't, then don't worry about it. Uh, I think it's important to live and be happy. I, you know, um, I've always been happier when I was chubby because I could eat everything I wanted. <laughs> um, now I've lost a little bit of weight. It's yeah, <laughs> it's not my favorite. <laughs> Alex, um, uh, you know, as we said, this was not uh, this was not how Julia thought of food, right? It wasn't uh, it wasn't as much. Well, let me modify that because actually another famous Julia quote is everything in moderation. 
Um, she would say, you should eat a little bit of everything. Uh, you know, don't go on these crazy diets because it's very hard to keep the weight off and it's not particularly healthy. Um, so eat a little bit of everything in moderation. But then she would say, uh, everything in moderation, including moderation. Um, meaning that once in a while you've got to splurge uh, because it's inhuman to try to, you know, just be very ascetic about things. But uh, really, you know, she, she took the French approach, you know, don't snack between meals, um, eat well, you know, eat the freshest things you can, but just not too much of them, uh, get some exercise. Um, there were times when she had to go on a diet so that she could keep her, her looks for television and she really resented it. Um, and, uh, you know, there, she did do some sort of diet recipes, but you can tell her heart's not in it. What she really liked was a nice, you know, a lot of butter and cream and, and, and a delicious sauce, uh, but in moderation. I think everything in moderation, including moderation, is going to be my new favorite motto. For <laughs> there you sure. go. Uh, this has been wonderful. Thank you. I want to invite um, uh, our, our, my colleague Jamie back for a moment who just uh, wants to add something. Hi, Jamie. Hi, everybody. It's me again. Thank you. Um, just with a final message for support, you know, GBH aims to inspire our audience in a way that not only educates, but also entertains and inspires. And we, re we rely on financial support from members to keep offering programs and virtual events like this one. So if you're able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustaining member or $60 all at once, you will receive your very own copy of the book we've been talking about throughout today's event. People who love to eat are always the best people. And that would be our gift for you for making a donation and helping to support the station. So help to support the station that created How To Television with Julia Childs, the French chef. Please visit wgbh.org slash, excuse me, support events and make a donation, or you can text the word Julia, J-U-L-I-A, uh, to 800-492-1111. And we're gonna lay out the directions again in our chat section of the event. Thanks again for joining us. And moreover, thank you for your support. Back to you, Craig. Thank you, Jamie, so much. And uh, I, I want to thank all of our guests. I can't tell you how much fun it's been to chat with all of you today. Thank you so much for, for being here, for sharing your, your love of, of uh, cooking and, uh, and your love of Julia Child, which I think we all share. Uh, this has been an absolute joy, and, and I'm, I'm so grateful to all of you for, for being with us and to everybody in the audience today. Thank you. I'm sorry that we wouldn't, couldn't get to all of your questions. There were a lot of great questions. We got to as many of them as we could. Um, but, um, you know, uh, thanks for joining us and please join us for more events in the future. Um, and hey, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Thank you you too. Thank you. Thank you.